So we were looking for a place to start the film and to keep the focus on Putin. And it seemed to us that one of the more insightful moments about who Putin is in this uh, in this war is that National Security Council meeting that he has about the um, breakaway provinces. Can you describe it? We're going to have the footage of him walking in by himself, being at the end of the room, uh, his advisors arrayed on the other side. Can you describe that moment, um, what we're seeing? Yeah. That Security Council meeting was so wild. And the whole time I was watching it, I kept thinking, this is what a Politburo meeting in 1939 must have looked like when everybody sitting in a cabinet minister's chair was the third replacement since 1937. And each person sitting in that chair knew what had happened to his predecessors and uh, you know how many bullets they got in the back of the head in the basement of Lubanka. And I just figured this is how it must have gone down. This is how it must have felt. This is how these people must have spoken. Uh, this is, you know, that fear, that discomfort, that they were clearly, you know, dancing bears performing for their uh, master who is impossible to please. What, what else struck me about it was um, the distance between him and the people sitting in that room was so vast. I mean, from every angle you could see it. Another thing that stuck out to me was Sergei Narushkin, the spy chief, getting up there, stumbling through his words, getting up, dressing down by Vladimir Putin, who says, no, no, speak clearly, no, speak clearly, no, that's not it, say it again. You know, he, he dressed him down like a, like a schoolboy, and this is one of the main Siloviki. He is the head of the SVR, the uh, Foreign Spy Service. And what's fascinating is that that Security Council meeting was pre-taped. It was shown on Russian state TV as a live broadcast. They told their viewers it was live, but then Russian journalists noticed that everybody's watches showed a different time. So they taped that, and they decided to show Narushkin getting humiliated like that, like a schoolmaster taking him to task. So the fact that they chose to show that was really interesting, and it made a lot of observers wonder if this was in retaliation or because Putin suspected that the leaks were coming from Narushkin's people. Because everybody was wondering, how did the Americans have such good intelligence? They knew each step of what Putin was going to do. I mean, once the war started moving, it, was, it all went as the White House had predicted it would. And some people saw that scolding of Narushkin as a kind of retaliation or a show of suspicion that, you know, he wasn't being careful enough in protecting the information. There are a couple other things I want to say about that meeting because it was fascinating. Um, so while everybody noticed Narushkin, wh the person who really stuck out to me was Zolotov, the head of the of Rosgvardia, the National Guard. This unit was formed shortly after the pro-democracy pro protests of 2011-2012 and after the anti-war protests of 2014 when Russia first invaded Ukraine. Putin started creating more and more security agencies and giving them more and more powers to stifle street protests and stifle dissent. There was even uh, a law that was passed that allowed them to shoot live ammunition into crowds of unarmed protesters. So to head up this new security agency called the Roskvardia, or the Russian Guard, he picked Viktor Zolotov, who was his old bodyguard. And this is, you know, uh, this is a, I want to say, a mace in human form, or, you know, a club in human form. Just completely loyal muscle and fists. And what you saw in that meeting was he gets up there in his uniform with his striped uh, military, standard issue military undershirt, ranting about the Americans and how the Ukrainians are just American puppets. And of course, at the same time, his grandson lives in London. You know, um, th that was the thing about pretty much everybody in that meeting. They were up there, they went up there and dutifully said what the master wanted them to say both about the breakaway republics and about the West, while 
all of them have relatives and property in the West. The other person who really stuck out to me was Valentina Matvienko, who is the speaker of the Federation Council, which is the upper chamber of the Russian parliament. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody look more uncomfortable on camera. It reminded me a little bit of the appearances we used to get in the first decade of Putin's rule of Lyudmila Putina, who was then his wife, who would periodically get trotted out, who never looked happy to be there. And just Matvienko sitting there, you could just, she looked nauseous. She looked queasy and uneasy and like as almost as if she was trying to um, avoid having to speak. And the last thing I'll say about the Security Council meeting is we now know a week into the war, more and more information is coming out of Moscow about how shocked everybody is in the Kremlin, in the defense ministry, in the foreign ministry. Nobody, not even people pretty close to Putin, thought he would do this. They thought he would recognize the breakaway republics, maybe move some troops in, and that would be the extent of it. Nobody expected this. People in the Kremlin and in the uh, prime minister's office are telling journalists anonymously that they're absolutely stunned and they don't, they kind of don't know what to do when they didn't expect this and they're just like shell-shocked. People in the Ministry of Defense, including pretty high-ranking members of the Ministry of Defense, are just completely stunned and seem kind of, um, seem to have been completely caught off guard by Putin's orders to launch a full-scale invasion. You know, I, I read those news stories about anonymous sources in the Kremlin and in the prime minister's office and in the foreign ministry being against this and being shell-shocked. And I think, well, why don't they all resign? You know, you can't arrest them all. Why don't they resign? Why don't they not follow these orders if they think it, they're deranged, which they clearly do? I think back to that Security Council meeting and I realize how scared they must all be of him, how they are all locked into this closed solar system with him as the center, and they're all afraid of getting arrested or fall, uh, falling from grace. They don't, they have no life outside of this. They can't exist outside of the government. If you're not in, if you get that high up and that close to Putin, if you fall, you don't fall back to civilian life. You go to jail, you lose everything. And they have been living in, they also have clearly been living in this atmosphere of fear that they are also helping foment in the nation and spread in the country, but they themselves are clearly scared. But you see how this all went down, or you're starting to see in retrospect how this all happened and how much of it was driven just by one man, his deranged ideas, and how every, everybody around him thought it was a terrible idea but was too scared to say anything about it or to resist. And it just makes me feel like, oh, I'm getting a, a sneak peek into how it worked in the 1930s. Is there any question about who is making the decisions in that room and who is making the decisions about leading the country into war? Oh no, it was it was very clear and as we now know it's very clearly just Putin's war. The the Russian army is fighting it and you can tell they're doing it half-heartedly, reluctantly, poorly, but it's his war that they're waging. I think the Security Council meeting, you know, it's like a Russian election. Did people vote for Putin? Yes, technically they did. Did most of the people who voted technically vote for Putin? Yes, they did. Did he technically win every election he's run in? He absolutely did. Is he a democratically elected president of Russia? No, he's not, right? Because the elections weren't free and fair because the political system is absolutely rigged and monopolized by the Kremlin. And, and so it is with the Security Council meeting. Did he ask everybody's opinion? He, yes, he did. Did everybody, volunteer themselves, technically. The idea that Putin should recognize these breakaway republics, they did. Was it done voluntarily? Do they really believe that that should have been done? Probably not, we don't know. But it's this very Soviet obsession with bureaucracy and ticking the boxes and insisting on the form while completely 
abandoning or perverting the substance, if that makes sense. It does. It does. And it's very helpful. We're probably going to follow, follow that with the, the moment of him announcing what he, he calls the special operation. It's the war. We're about to go and explore his life and what led him to that moment. So when you see him lead Russia into this war, does it feel to you like a culmination of, of a lifetime from the KGB, from rising up, that, that this, is a, this is a seminal moment for him or something he's been building towards? I think it's too pat to say that it's something he's building, he's been building toward his whole life from his days in the KGB, et cetera. I think that's too pat a narrative. I think he's clearly been building up to this for the last decade and definitely for the last few years. That speech was really interesting because it was not about NATO. It wasn't even really about Ukraine. It was mostly about the US. It was about this eschatological battle between Russia and the US, between Washington and Moscow, whether it is Soviet Moscow and Cold War era Washington or their present day versions, it almost didn't matter. And it, it felt like he had this unfinished Cold War business with the US, like he wanted to finish the fight that had um, you know, ended in a draw almost in 1991. So in that sense, I think it is a culmination of that kind of paranoiac Cold War thinking that he absorbed in the KGB. What I think is really important to convey to people who have never met somebody who used to work in the KGB or in the FSB is that these people are incredibly paranoid. They're incredibly conspirologically minded. It's this KGB way of thinking that every door is a trap door, every wall has you know, uh, s some kind of secret hiding place behind it. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, right? That everything is a false bottom, that everybody has a puppeteer, that um, just like in the Cold War, every war was a proxy between the Soviet Union and, and the US, so it is here. And so if Russia has designs on Ukraine and the West is against it, that must be because Ukraine is a puppet of the US. What was also interesting about that speech was you know, the first, it was about half an hour. The first 15 minutes were about the U.S. So we in the West have come to think of the Cold War as a bad thing. We celebrated its end. We unanimously think that the end of the Cold War is an unalloyed good. Putin does not agree. And he first laid this out for the world in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference when he said the Cold War was good. He said it was a bipolar world. We, one pole center of power was in Washington and the other was in Moscow. And they balanced each other and they provided checks on each other. And he said, and this is a quote, he said it provided for global security, which of course ignores the fact that there were bloody proxy wars everywhere, you know, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Nicaragua, Ethiopia, uh, Vietnam, El Salvador. Uh, but, but in his mind, it was a good time. Russia was on top of the world. Russia was one of the two big guys calling the shots. Moscow's opinion always had to be taken into account. Moscow had to be asked for permission. Moscow could mess up Washington's plans anywhere in the world. And he would like to get back to that. And the same way that in 2007, he laid at the US's doorstep all the faults and all the problems that had come out of this new unipolar world order, as he called it, with only the US calling the shots. And I mean, this was 2007. That was the height of the insurgency in Iraq. Afghanistan was starting to go sideways. Bush's program of democracy promotion all over the world was bringing revolution to countries in Russia's orbit, former Soviet republics. And he said, you know, this unipolar world order, what has it gotten? It has, has gotten us blood and chaos in Iraq, in Afghanistan. And he reprised that theme again when he announced that he was invading Ukraine. He said again, it, this is 
this is not okay. America can't call all the shots. The Cold War was good. Now that there is no balance, no counterweight to the U.S., we got Iraq, we got Syria, we got Egypt, we got Libya, we got Afghanistan. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, okay, fair enough, but what does that have to do with Ukraine? Ukraine didn't do any of these things. And then when he does get to talking about Ukraine, he talks about it first as uh, first as a puppet of the U.S. So still framing it in the con in the context of the U.S. And then he repri reprises another thing that he said many times, which is that Ukraine is not a real country. Ukrainians are basically Russian. Ukrainians and Russian are one, Russians are one people. He said in, in 2008 to George W. Bush at Bucharest when George W. Bush and Condoleezza Rice pushed NATO to open their doors to Georgia and Ukraine, Putin said to George Bush then, he said, George, you know Ukraine is not a real country. So what we're seeing now is not a new Putin. We're seeing a Putin that is kind of distilled, concentrated. There's also been a lot of talk that this is the product of isolation. The thing that's so interesting about it is that Putin frames it in terms of strategic balance and NATO and the threat to Russia. And we, usually we think about wars and international relations in terms of a balance of power. And I think the question for you and the question we have in the film is like, how much of this is that strategic balance between Russia and, and NATO? And how much of this is the fears and the anxieties and things of one man that, that have built up over a lifetime? I think it's a combination of things. I think, first, he turns 70 in October. He loves round dates. Or is that? No, that's, I'm sorry, that's a Russianism. What is that? How do you say that? Like, Krugle <laughs> that means a round date. Significant numbers? Like, yeah, like, um, you know, like big anniversaries or... Um, so the first thing that's important to note is he turns 70 in October. He, is, he puts a lot of stock in numbers and big important dates and anniversaries. It's also an age to which most Russian men never live. He has outlived the vast majority of his, of his cohort. He is clearly thinking about his legacy and has been for some time. Uh, I think Ukraine was always a missing piece in the legacy. Um, far smarter people than I have written about this, but from the Kremlin's point of view, or from Putin's point of view, in the fall of 2021, he has vanquished the opposition. I mean, there's nobody left. People are either dead in jail or in exile. Civil society has been eviscerated. There's barely any independent media left. The economy is doing pretty well. It has survived the sanctions of the last few years. He has squirreled away these massive reserves, 600 something billion. He has slowly built up Russia's position in the world, often by playing spoiler, and often by taking the US down a few pegs. He has kind of equalized, or more has, rebalanced the power dynamic between Russia and the US. He's built a good relationship with China. He has filled the vacuum left in the Middle East by the US withdrawal. He has moved into parts of Africa and Latin America. He has, in his mind, reestablished Russia as a superpower on the world stage. And all that's missing is Ukraine which, recall, he does not believe is a real country, which he believes historically is part of Russia, and which needs to be brought back into the fold. So we're gonna go back, we'll have launched the war, and we'll go back into his life as a KGB agent, his rise, his fears watching the color revolutions, watching the uh, Arab Spring, watching uh, Ukraine, and then having sent troops and captured um, Crimea. 
And we'll pick up sometime around then, around 2015, as he's contemplating what he's going to do in the American election in, in 2016. And who is Putin at that moment as he's about to make this decision that he's going to interfere in the election? He's about to do a bunch of other things that you've talked about, become more and more aggressive. Who is he? Because we'll have watched him rise up to that point um, and get more and more fearful that the U.S. is trying to overthrow him. Um, uh, what, where does he see himself at that moment after yeah. Crimea has happened? I think in 2015, Putin is riding high. He managed to dupe the West and outfox them by quickly invading Crimea and annexing it before anybody can really fully realize what's going on or stop him. He starts this astroturf separatist war in the East all done under the cover of plausible deniability. In the Donbass, there are volunteers. In Crimea, there are little green men who just went to the army surplus store and got Russian military fatigues. And the U.S. couldn't stop him. And, and they're, you know, wringing their hands and wondering if they should send lethal aid, et cetera. In the meantime, he's getting everything he wanted. He got a huge bump domestically by annexing Crimea, by bringing back a part of what is seen erroneously by Russians as part of the Russian heartland, or historic heartland. I mean, his approval ratings go through the roof. The US and the EU and several other countries have imposed sanctions on him, but he has ridden them out fully. He's fine, the economy's fine. It has managed to recover and start thriving even. What else is happening? He has managed to splinter Europe. He has managed to take, o take advantage of the Obama administration's waffling on the Middle East to get involved in Syria and therefore make it even more impossible for the U.S. to do anything. So he has kind of drawn a line in the sand so that the U.S. can't topple Bashar al-Assad. He has become very close with the Israeli government, with Bibi Netanyahu, uh, you know, muscling in on what is traditionally American geopolitical turf, right? There's the, the, uh, the truism in Washington is that America has no closer ally in the Middle East than Europe. Well, suddenly the Israeli prime minister is going to Moscow more often than he's going to Washington. He's selling arms to American allies, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, who are some of the biggest buyers of American arms and are seen as allies of, of the U.S. But he's very, he's very confident in himself. Very confident. And his ability to. Yeah. He does take this risk in the, in the election. And, and, it, and he gets, you know, whether or not he had any influence on the outcome of the election, he gets credit for it from a lot of people. Trump ends up winning. There's some sanctions and some diplomats kicked out. But what does he take out out from the end of that? Is he more, even more emboldened at the end of um, 2016? Well, first of all, I don't think he expected Trump to win. So that was a huge bonus because at the time, everybody in the Kremlin and in Russia thought, well, at the time, everybody in, in the Kremlin and everybody was Kremlin adjacent thought that Trump was their greatest ally and that he would be there as one former Kremlin advisor told me that he would be our wrecking ball inside America. They didn't expect to get that lucky. I don't think they expected Americans to get so worked up. And on one hand, they didn't like it because it caused, it brought about all these sanctions and a vilification of Russia. On the other hand, now Americans thought they were 12 feet tall and, and perfect villains. And I think the fact that we still don't know and we'll never be able to know whether Putin and the Russians influenced the outcome of the elections is it's kind of part of the brilliance of the operation, right? They're, they've gotten in our heads. Um, and, and Trump, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, and then he ultimately, he ultimately gets away with it. You know, Trump is grateful because Trump has been briefed that Putin tried to help him win. Trump is grateful. He likes Putin because he wants to be like Putin. It's the kind of guy he can understand and relate to because that's the kind of leader he wants to be. And even though every once in a while 
Trump's own administration and Congress are rolling out sanctions against Russia. He's also constantly kneecapping NATO. He is undermining the EU at every turn. He is exacerbating divisions inside the European Union, which is just you know music to Putin's ears. He's doing, he's doing Putin's work for him. So even with the sanctions, which were, I think, of minimal impact to the Russian economy. He, I think he saw that as a win. I think he clocked that as a win. And that means it was a signal to keep going, to take more risks. One thing we may, we may use is that meeting that they have in Helsinki and oh God. the two of them. And I mean, and what, what must Putin be thinking and what, what lessons is he taking from Trump um, as he's, as he's meeting him, as he's watching him, um, just embodying Trump's presidency, sort of in that moment, what is Putin taking away from from that that he that's going to um, shape the way he sees things going forward? I think at that meeting, when Trump says in front of the world, in front of the American press, in front of everybody, that he trusts Putin more than he trusts the American intelligence community and the American political system. I mean. Right? You can roll the credits there. That is such a win for Putin. It is such a, you know, it's like watching your enemy shoot himself in both feet, both hands. Uh, it's your enemy admitting that you are better, that you are stronger, that you are, I mean, it's everything he's ever wanted. It's for the U.S. to admit that the U.S. is stupid and weak and bad and that Russia is good and strong and powerful. Um, he should have. I mean, he should have stopped there. That was that was a big win. Trump is out. He watches Trump Trump lose, and Biden comes oh, in. Oh, I think I think. Um, well, sorry, I think one one crucial yeah. thing there is. Uh, um, what's it called? The Skripal, the poisonings. Yes. Uh, that I mean, was he, because he's also becoming more more active. Overseas and pushing limits and doing Was that fall of 2018? Risk. Was that after Helsinki? I can't remember. I think so. Um, March of 2018. Oh, so before Helsinki. But I think that's part of the risk taking, right? He, he he's gotten away with everything so far. So why not push it a little step further? He's he has this guy. He's been a thorn in his side for a long time. He's a traitor, and Putin has said publicly that traitors belong dead in the, or traitors will always end up dead in the ditch. And he does something unthinkable. He has people enter UK territory with military grade nerve agent. Of course they mess it up and they don't, you know, they don't end up killing the guy, but they kill a random British woman. And what, what could the West do? They expelled some diplomats, so Russia expelled some diplomats too. And whenever that happens, because a lot of Russia's diplomats aren't official, Russia wins, even though it's like tit for tat and diplomat for diplomat when they expel them, somehow Russia always ends up having more diplomats when it's done, right? So like, even after consequences were imposed, they still, they still won that round because that sent such a strong message to any potential defector, to any potential critic that you're not safe anywhere. You're not even safe in the West. I think you're right that that's such an important moment. Trump comes out uh, or is voted out, out of office and Biden comes in, um, somebody who's not as much of a supporter as Trump was, but he's watching America, he's watching January 6th, he's watching Afghanistan. What does Putin see in America that might lead him to think that this is a moment when he could take Ukraine? I think he correctly sees America as a nation so divided that it's paralyzed, that it is a nation at each other's throats that can't agree on anything. And whatever one team says, the other team will say just the opposite just because. He sees a, a president who, on one hand, he's dealt with before, Biden, was put in charge of the Ukraine portfolio in 2014 um, because Obama had not enough time to deal with it. And frankly, I don't think cared that much about Ukraine. 
So on one hand, he has uh, he's dealing with a new president who is old, who has been around, who has Putin's number, who is surrounded by aides and advisors and um, people in the State Department and the White House and then the Pentagon who know Putin well, who know his tricks, who see right through him. But on the other hand, he barely has control of Congress. He doesn't have the Supreme Court. He doesn't have the American public. And then Afghanistan happens. And the message that sends to Putin and I think to the rest of the world is that America is done with its adventures abroad. America is tired of it. America is turning even more inward. America has no more appetite for war. It has expended all the energy it possibly had for war. It's spent. And if Putin were to do something now, America wouldn't retaliate because why end a long uh, foreign war? Why take such a political hit because it's done so messily just to get your troops bogged down in another thing? And I think that was a very accurate read of the, of the situation. Something you were gonna talk about before, and I said we'd get to it later, is these images of Putin during the time of COVID, of video conferences, being at the end of a long table, really looking like somebody in, in their own world, you know, I, physically isolated. What do you make of those images that, we, that we've seen of Putin over the last two years, and, and how has that played into this? So in 2018, I went on a reporting trip to Moscow, and well, actually in 2018, I went on a book research trip to Moscow, and I met up with one of my old friends who is a reporter in the Kremlin press pool. He's had that position forever. He's really good. He really understands the workings of the Kremlin. And we had dinner and I asked him, you know, the economy was not doing so well. There was a lot of public discontent around the presidential elections, around the fact that a lot of people had been arrested all over the country, that Alexei Navalny was disqualified from running. And he said, you know, everybody in the Kremlin thinks everything's going great. They are not getting good information, and whatever information they have is not getting to the top. And they have no idea what's happening. They think everybody's happy. That was 2018. Then COVID comes along, and Putin's paranoia kicks in. Uh, his instinct for self-preservation kicks in. And even though he tells the country after a brief lockdown, he says, look, we can't shut down our economy. We're not a rich Western country. He said, we don't have a rich gram uh, we don't have a rich auntie like America does. We have to stay at work, go to work. Meanwhile, he retreats into total isolation. For a while there was um, there was this weird contraption that people had to walk through and get sprayed with this weird mist that was supposed to uh, decontaminate them or something before meeting with Putin. Then he started isolating and anybody who had to see, who wanted to see him had to isolate quarantine for two weeks in a ho especially in a hotel set aside for that purpose. Staff, bodyguards, advisors, the president of Kazakhstan had to sit in a hotel room for two weeks and get meals brought to his door so that he could see Putin. Uh, people like Andrei Kostin, who's the head of VTB Bank, which is known as the wallet of the FSB, which was just sanctioned, had to quarantine for two weeks. Um, people who are tr were trusted close people had to quarantine. And you can imagine what kind of isolation that breeds. Meanwhile, you know, Russia ends up having one of the highest, if not the highest per capita COVID death rate. So, Russians had to go to work and die of COVID to keep up the, the Russian economy. I mean, nothing changed. People, people partied, people went to restaurants, movies, everything, like rode the metro. Uh, but Putin stayed in isolation. And there's reports trickling out, again, from the presidential administration, from the defense ministry, that a lot of his advisors think this is partly the product of isolation, that he went a little batty in, you know, two years of basically self-imposed solitary confinement, which as we know, does very strange things to the mind. Um, 
I do think it's funny to think though that, you know, we all got cabin, cabin fever at some point during these COVID lockdowns and most people, you know, like, baked bread or bought too much stuff on Amazon. And he's like, I'll invade Ukraine. It's just, um, it's wild. I mean, it's also a physical manifestation of something that has been ratcheting up over his presidency, which is taking out critics, people who might threaten him, people who disagree with him, anybody who's outside of his own, his own view of the world. So I think this really started with 2014. Before 2014, well, it started with 2012, 2014, before the protests, before the annexation of Crimea, Putin had a pretty diverse circle of advisors. They included the Hawks, the old, his old KGB friends and um, KGB alums, the kind of Siloviki, the, the strongmen. And then there were the so-called liberals, the people who had economic, fancy economics degrees, who had worked in the banking sector, who spent all their time courting Western investors to come and invest in Russia and who were trying to open Russia more and more to the West and to integrate it into the global economy. And there was always a tension between those two camps, between the liberals and the Siloviki. And the seesaw went back and forth, back and forth. And then after the protests of 2012, when Putin felt that the white collar urban upper middle class betrayed him when he had been so good to them, in making them wealthy. And in 2014, when a lot of those same liberals found the annexation of Crimea to be anathema and came out and protested against him, he basically cut out the liberals then because they were advising him not to do this, not to go further in Ukraine because there could be more and more sanctions. They would be damaging to the Russian economy that it's not worth it for a peninsula or not worth it there's a little bit of land in eastern Ukraine. And he responded by just shutting them out. And so then after 2014, it was just a circle of the Siloviki. And then even that circle got smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And now, as far as we know, it's a circle of like two or three people who, by the looks of things, are even crazier than Putin. Putin is like the moderating voice in that crew. As he's thinking about invading Ukraine, does he understand the state of the Russian military, the views of the Ukrainian people, the approach of the West? Does he understand what, what is going on? No, I don't think Putin understands. I think he made a colossal miscalculation, and we're seeing it on the ground every single day. He thought Ukrainians were Russians, that they agree with him that Ukraine is basically just an outpost of Russia and can be easily folded back into Russia. Clearly, Ukrainians don't agree. He thought Russian troops would be greeted as liberators with flowers on the streets of Ukraine. Instead, they're greeting them with Molotov cocktails. They're trying to stop the tanks with their bare hands. They're greeting them with javelins, with signs that say, Russians fuck off. Um, they're fighting to the death because they don't want to be part of Russia, because they disagree. And I don't think he understood or anticipated that that would happen, even though everybody could see that that was what would happen. Because everything that Putin has said he wanted to do in Ukraine, he has achieved the opposite of, starting in 2014. Before 2013, Ukraine really was a nation divided. There was the Russian-speaking East, where a lot of the people who lived there were the descendants of ethnic Russians who were brought in by the Soviets to work in the mines and the factories. They had no Ukrainian identity. They didn't speak Ukrainian. They didn't feel any kinship with the Ukrainian West, which had a slightly different version of Christianity, which spoke Ukrainian and was culturally different. And there was this constant seesaw. One presidential election, Ukraine would elect somebody from the Russian-speaking East that would be more friendly to the Kremlin, and then people wouldn't like that, and then they would sweep them out of power and elect a kind of pro-Western, Western Ukrainian person. And it went back and forth, back and forth. NATO membership was not very popular. Ukraine wasn't really sure what it was as a nation. Was it part of the old Russian-speaking former Soviet universe? Was it part of the West? Was it a European country or a former Soviet country? And then Putin invades in 2014, lops off a, a very strategic part of Ukraine, a beloved part of Ukraine where Ukrainians love to vacation, 
uh, he starts a bloody conflict in the East, which by the time of this current invasion had taken more than 13,000 lives and destroyed a lot of homes and infrastructure. And all of this has had the effect of rallying Ukrainians, both in the East and the West, around the Ukrainian flag, around the Ukrainian language, against Russia. So even people in the East who used to be pro-Russian hate Russia now, even before this invasion. They hated Russia. They didn't want to be a part of Russia anymore. You have Ukrainian politicians saying, the person who has formed our Ukrainian identity the most is Vladimir Putin. He gave us a national identity, you know, and, and now everybody wants to, again, before the invasion even, everybody wanted to join NATO. Then he invades and Finland wants to join NATO. Finland, which had been neutral forever. Sweden wants to join NATO. The EU, which was waffling forever and dragging its feet on accepting Ukraine, which was one of the reasons, um, it was an EU-Ukrainian economic cooperation agreement, one of the things that set off the Maidan revolution in 2013, 2014. Now it looks like Ukraine's going to get into the EU with a fast-track membership. He wanted a stable economy. He's destroyed that. I mean, he's just, he's miscalculated on so many fronts. And I think in part it's because he's so isolated and, you know, getting high on his own supply. What are the consequences of that, that on the human side, that Putin can make this decision that is going to affect both of these countries in such a profound way? I don't know. I think I'm too close to it. it I personally find it nauseating. I'm seeing in real time lives upended by it. And not just the way people are seeing it, you know, on their screens of apartment bu buildings being bombed and a million refugees fleeing Ukraine in just a week. And that's, you know, a million stories, a million heartbreaks. It's not just these conscripts who have no idea what they're doing or why they're there. It's not just the economic fallout in Russia, which we're just seeing the beginning of. It's, you know, I have friends on both sides of the border and you, there's nothing like watching people close to you as their future evaporates in front of them. Just all their plans, all their hopes, all their dreams, not just for the next five years, for the next week, for the next month, just gone in a day, up in smoke. And a total inability to help them, to console them. Um, watching my Russian friends flee Russia just with anything, they, whatever they have on their backs. By, you know, I have a friend who I hope she got across the border but was, you know, gunning on, in her car to the border trying to get to Latvia before Putin declared martial law. It's, it's infuriating. It's infuriating. Like, for what? For one man's mistaken reading of history? For his own ego? For his own warped understanding of legacy? I know it's part of the situation for you, but so thank you for talking about it. And, and my last question is how dangerous is this moment for right now? And how dangerous is Putin in this moment right now? Uh, and there's obviously all these not veiled threats about nuclear weapons, and there's talk of other countries being dragged in by mistake or on purpose. Um, how, how dangerous is Putin? I think he's more dangerous than he's ever been at any point in the last 22 years. I think he did not expect to lose in Ukraine, and therefore he will not lose. He will grind the country down to a fine, fine ash. And it doesn't matter how many Russian soldiers die in the process, how many Ukrainian soldiers and civilians die in the process. He will not be humiliated by people he calls little Russians. What that means for Europe, you know, if you just, even if you set that tragedy aside or that, you know, blooming tragedy aside, again, a million people in a week fled to some of the most xenophobic countries in Europe who right now are greeting them with open arms because A, they're their neighbors, and B, they're white and Christian and look like them. But how long does that last? How many more refugees can the West absorb? 
We saw with the refugee flows from Syria, they gave us Brexit, they gave us the rise and the empowerment of the far right in Germany, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, in France. Is this going to keep emboldening the far right? And when Putin threatens the use of nuclear weapons, he threatened it the first time when he declared war on Thursday morning. He threatened again three days into the war when he saw it wasn't going well. He threatened it in 2018 when he went to that air show and he gave that crazy presentation about all the new nuclear weapons he had that could strike the US. If people think that he won't use them, I think they're mistaken. Everything Putin has showed us at every step of the last 22 years is that every time he think he, we think he won't go that far, he does. We think he won't come back for a third term, he did. He won't annex Crimea, he did. He won't invade Ukraine, he did. He won't try to kill Navalny, he did. He won't try to subvert an American election, he did. And so why would we believe that this time he won't do what he says he'll do? I mean, it's unthinkable. Like, the, the, what he has opened up with this invasion is unthinkable. And because he is losing, and because the sanctions and the Ukrainians are humiliating him, because he is backed into a corner, he is the most dangerous he has ever been because it is now existential for him. And if you think he doesn't know that everybody in the world understands that the only way to end this is to put a bullet between his eyes, he knows. And that makes him also much more dangerous.